So I'd like to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, they kind of asked me to talk about uh, surgical prophylaxis. They just did some updated guidelines come out. Kind of how this impacts pharmacy. And to be honest with you, I didn't do a lot of the surgical prophylaxis prior to this and kind of got thrust into it just at the Detroit Hospital um, within the Detroit Medical Center. So hopefully I can impart some uh, form of wisdom on, um, to you, but keep in mind that I learned as I did too. I don't want anything to disclose. I don't have any financial obligations to anybody um, from a drug standpoint. So if you want to pay me to be uh, speaking, I'd be happy to speak or to do regardless of the um, but you know, when I thought about how I would go about giving this talk, I was like, I don't want to be boring because, you know, you think surgical prophylaxis is not incredibly exciting, you think you, it's not a damn way to accept this talk, it's not going to be the MRSA thing, uh, topics that we need to do. But nonetheless, a very important topic, but my goal, um, more so than the program goals you see in your book, is to actually not be this guy um, when you're talking to things, you know, who that is, and uh, you're pretty cool in my book because I would really love to do it now. Um, but really what I want to kind of talk about is rather really tell you how surgical site infections really impact patient outcomes because they can be very severe. And also identify why we prophylax and which actual um, surgical procedures we would provide prophylaxis for. And then also kind of where would you go to find an evidence-based uh, prophylactic regimen for one of the patients for help develop um, for your institution. And again, pharmacy technicians would mimic that. So I want to impart to you that you know, it's very important because we need to get these drugs to the patients that need them. So it's be quite very valuable. So before we go um, any further, we need to kind of talk about what a surgical site infection is, right? And I think that that's you know, where you start from. Well, really, it's a wound uh, resulting in a bacterial overgrowth at the site of a surgical incision. And I think the thing that we forget about it is that this is a spectrum of disease. I mean, you can see that you can have very superficial incisional skin and soft tissue infections encompassing only the skin and subcutaneous fat layers. But keep in mind, a lot of our patients, especially those undergoing major surgeries, can have skin infections that go all the way down into the deep incisional muscle and fascia, but also into the organ spaces. And again, if you cut into that deep and you interject bacterium, those infections can proceed into the into tissue and organ spaces spaces that lead to severe sepsis and even death in some of those patients. But infection is multifactorial. There's a lot of things, and I'll go into more detail in a little bit. There's patient-related factors. Patient comorbidities may put them at higher risk for these infections. You have things like procedural factors. Are you putting in prosthetic materials? Um, is there trauma? Is the surgical technique good? Um, these are all playing into how if the patient is going to develop an infection. The microbial factors. What organism is it? Does it produce certain adherence factors? Is the tissue set up and primed for the to be adhered to? Is there clotting and fibrinogen? And those kinds of things are all important in the development of the surgical site infection. And also the presence or absence of prophylaxis. So did you appropriately give them the drug that would prevent uh, the growth of these bacteria? Um, and did you cover it appropriately for the pathogen and the site of uh, the surgery? So all of these are important as we think about wrapping our head around this topic. And then why do we even discuss them? I think, you know, I don't know if you met it in pharmacy school. I don't, I don't remember ever having a discussion about surgical site infections. I remember reading about spasm being used for it, but I never really had a, somebody explain to me why it's important to do that. But again, really, if you think about it, it comprises a significant portion of healthcare-associated infections. Some hospitals have reported being their number one healthcare-associated infection, not just being their number four behind hospital part of pneumonia urinary tract infection, or those kinds of things. But again, if, if you look nationally, the National um, Healthcare Safety Network published a nice paper a few years ago, and it was the number four um, healthcare associated infection. So again, it comprises a significant amount of hospital resources, because remember, each time somebody gets an infection, you've got to spend more money to treat that infection. And then again, let's think about the patient level outcomes, OK? Um, you've got to think about it here. Uh, you've got the source of significant morbidity and mortality, which I said before. And you got a one, one report that noted 20.7% of patients with MRSA, skin and soft tissue infection, secondary to surgical site infections, died compared to patients with MSSA. Now keep in mind these patients with MSSA, MSSA still had an infection. But again, resistance in the infectious world leads to even worse outcomes. And we're starting to see that MRSA is comprising a larger component of our healthcare associated infections. So again, we need to be cognizant of those and we need to do this talk. Again, patients who get an infection stay longer in the hospital. On average, about five more days. This can vary depending upon the institution 
and with the surgery that you're not talking about. Remember, there's different levels of surgery where the side of infection. These patients may be more critically ill and require more acute care. And then let's think about cost, because that's all we think about now is money, right? And when, 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 when it's in the news, it's in the paper, it's, 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 it's all about health care, dollars, dollars, dollars. So let's look at this. Patients with MRSA infections, average cost was about $118,000 versus NSSA, which was about seventy-three dollars or $52,000. So again, double. But think about that. If they get an infection with a susceptible organism, MSSA, which sounds okay, it still costs a considerable amount of money. So again, preventing all these types of infections is very cost advantageous to hospitals and institutions in general. So as we move to it, you know, this is a typical, you know, it's not, it's not the, what is it, Seattle Grace with the Grace Anatomy crew, the Grace Anatomy, and these are surgeons doing their uh, jobs in the OR using stuff that I used to use as fishing uh, things to kind of help out the patients. But again, as we move through the, uh, through the risk, we can think about it as being patient-related factors, so things that are specific to the patient, and things that are specific to the actual procedure that impart a higher risk of infection. Now we look at a patient's age. Many reports would say, oh, if you have an older patient, they're at higher risk for infection. Some dispel that, it's kind of conflicting, though a lot of people would consider older patients at high risk. Our diabetic patients are patients with poor blood glucose control. There's one report that noted a 100% increased risk of infection and cardiothoracic surgery with a, per a perioperative blood glucose of about 200. Again, controlling that diabetes uh, perioperatively would be very advantageous for us. Obesity has been linked time and time again with the risk of surgical side infections. And whether or not that's because the techniques of the surgeons are altered to accommodate the increased weight, or the fact that when we dose them, we don't really take into account the weight of the patient. We dose them as we would dose any other patients. Um, uh, with our Patient malnutrition, so again, remember your ability to wound, to heal wounds, is dependent upon your patient's nutritional status. So, well, colonization with staph aureus in general, not just MRSA, leads to, if someone reports a fourfold risk increase of developing a surgical site infection versus patients who aren't colonized. And again, immunosuppressive medications may play a role. All of these just within the patient, I haven't even gotten to the procedure. If we look at just the procedures, the pre-surgical pre hair removal, you see a risk of about 10% of patients who, use, who get razors to remove hair from the surgical site. Now that may not sound like, you know, why would you want to remove surgical or hair from the surgical field, but keep in mind some people who look like a blue man are going to be able to see what you're cutting, right? Um, but even then, think about hair um, being a place where bacteria can hide, and they can remove that, but they also now use non razor methods, which actually decrease the rate from, I believe, 10% down to about 2 to 3%. Um, that's very Skin preparation, I'll kind of talk about this in a second. Um, some centers do chlorhexidine bathing, some do iodine per pre-op. Um, it depends on the site. But a lot of these have been heavily studied in hopes of decreasing surgical side effects. So I'll go into why we don't just do topical in a second. Antimicrobial prophylaxis, that's where we come in. We can help with the dosing, the selection, and of course stocking of these agents in the water areas to improve the ability of our patients to get um, these therapies. And again, temperature or surgical technique I kind of heard from before. If you look at surgeons who do more operations, they tend to have lower infection rates. They do this time and time again. Their, their technique is very good. Versus going to somebody who doesn't really do that surgical technique very much. They may not do it a lot. So again, you may get more, more local tissue trauma, more uh, clotting, more bleeding. And again, some of these things can have higher risk of infection. <coughs> I did not know this before I actually started reading about this, but temperature control in the ORs needs to be optimized. If patients experience hypothermia, you decrease things like complement, neutrophil activity, and chemotaxis to sites of infection or bacterial colonization, so you don't clear those bacteria. The site becomes able to be primed for infection. And then environment and equipment. Again, I think we all would agree we need to sterilize and make sure we're using um, good aseptic techniques in these areas. But again, all of these things will be one are in affect our patients' risk of infection. Well, historically, uh, epidemiologists and surgeons used to utilize these uh, classifications for operative wounds. If you look here, you have class one, which is clean. You have class two, which is clean contaminated. And you typically see these, in, especially in the new guidelines. The reason why they discuss them is, again, it's kind of hard to get through um, the historical getting rid of it completely because you're going to see a quote of a lot of available data. But at the same time, the reason why we don't necessarily see class three and class four in the, the prophylaxis guidelines is because this is an actual infection. These patients are going to be treated.
for an infection because there's gross spillage of, say, fecal material into the peritoneum um, during the abdominal surgery or trauma case, or you have a patient who had um, maybe nicked uh, the bowel and sat in on a hospital floor for a couple of days and has frank peritonitis. I mean, these aren't going to be a prophylaxis per se, they're going to be treated um, for an infection. And then what, kind of, what do we kind of have to fear? Again, I kind of talked about staph on a couple of my examples, but again, you would think that would be a high, uh, high risk of infection. And again, you're right. Most staph aureus is a big player as well as coagulase negative staph, um, especially in the implantation of prosthetic materials. You can see coagulase negative staph playing more role, as well as streptococci. I mean, these are all skin flow. You're cutting through the skin to get to the site that the surgeon wants to get to. These, these bacteria may be carried with the surgeon's instruments into the deeper tissue spaces. If I have a clean contaminated wound, so let's think here like an intra-abdominal um, case, you may have uh, spillage of, of, of fecal material. So think about things that comprise of fecal material. You think of things like Bacilla, E. coli, and again, there's, there's very good evidence for bacteria as the gelis, given its encapsulated organism, is able to bypass our body's immune system and then form an abscess and then uh, lead to that outcome if we don't uh, appropriately prophylax our patient. So when we consider surgical procedures, we really have to kind of consider well, what kind of case am I doing and what kind of pathogens do I need to be concerned about. And the guidelines really that are published really do a good job at outlining these cases, what, what kind of pathogens would you be concerned about, and you can take that back to your local antivirus and determine the best drug that you have that's available. Again, a few moments ago I discussed, why don't we just do topical nearby, just rub bleach on them all and send them to the OO. But it's not that simple. If you think about how <coughs> bacteria are, they live in every crevice of our body. We're not sterile human beings, right? We have bacteria growing us all the time. But what tends to happen is you, the bacteria that live in the hair follicles or other crevices escape those <coughs> follicles. They're not able to work. And again, remember, a surgeon may cut through one of these areas, again, taking one of these bacteria into deeper tissue spaces. And you can even find reports, depending upon the material, if you put a prosthetic material in, all you need is maybe one cell to start an infection. And that can, given some of these, um, these materials that we utilize today, that's considerably high risk for an infection. So again, giving prophylaxis, make sure that we're doing good surgical technique, potentially not using those high risk um, um, materials anymore, it may be something we're going to do. So what can we as pharmacists do? And I think the biggest thing that I've learned is we can work with, work with local leaders in both surgery, anesthesia, nursing, perioperative, services to kind of come up with a feasible, good, good evidence-based guideline that works, right? So we're in the midst of doing that in the Detroit Medical Center. It's not fully implemented. It's a work in progress, I will tell you. But again, I think you have to work all together in order to do this. And again, some of the things that I've learned, you have to identify barriers to implementing these things. Are you able to scan? If you're an electronic, if you're all electronic, are you able to scan some of the OR areas that maybe weren't able to scan previously? Um, are you able to utilize the IT components? So again, order, order sets go from paper to virtualized in the electronic environment. Um, and then again, do you have to identify resistance? So at the Detroit Medical Center, we seem to have a predilection for attracting people who like staff. Um, so we have a high rate of MRSA at the Detroit Medical Center, in my hospital as well. So our surgeons are concerned about this because we see it a lot. Whereas you may not see it at some community or rural hospital. And then again, you have to get the antibiotics to the site. So as pharmacists and technicians, we have to make sure that we make the drugs in a timely manner, we get them to the OR if that's how we deliver them, or if they're stocked in an appropriate area, and they retain potency and they're easily accessible, and then likewise scan and, and administer them in a safe and timely manner. But then we may be close that further. You probably may become involved in evaluation of these cases, so you help play well, why was this drug not available? Well, how come this patient didn't receive the drug that they should have gotten? Um, and then again, why did this patient develop a resistant organism? Um, we may become involved in that as we, as we move further into the multidisciplinary group. Now, the first step, and I'll say that I have to read, I had to read. If you had to read these 100 page guidelines, you know, I don't usually like to read a lot of stuff, but you know, I have to say that to read these too. But they're very nice to done. They're, about a, you know, they're done by people who are a lot smarter than I am. They're affiliated with the Infectious Diseases Society of America the Surgical Infection Society, and of course the Society for Healthcare at the University. Um, so again, some pretty smart people came together and looked at the available evidence since they last got the guidelines. But one of the things that they did was they really focused on areas that are important. So I think the key update, 
are the things that I at least wanted to focus on. Because again, I didn't want to be at that time roaming on about cardiothoracic surgery, after the oxygen. But I think the big thing that I want to focus on, let's, let's look at these areas that they updated since the last time. Okay, perioperative dose timing. Last time they published the guideline, they just basically said at the induction of anesthesia. That's big, right? So that's not going to be feasible for drugs like vancomycin, where you start using it, when you can start it, how does it happen? Okay. Well, now they become more definitive, and I'll go into that as I include where the evidence comes from. Let's look at the dosing and selection of antibiotics, which, which antimicrobials have been studied in work. And then duration of prophylaxis. Well, how long do I have to continue this after the case? I think all these are important questions, and the guideline really is really considerable. So I, I'm not related to this guy, I'm not talking about time. But at the same time, perioperative dose timing, I think this is what comes to my mind. The rabbit's is late, it's late, it's late, it's late. But at the same time, let's, let's think about giving the dose. When is too late and when is too early? And I think one of the cool things that I have, I, um, I took this from the book. This, this uh, study really looked at uh, when would you give a time for the dose? Do you give it before the case, do you before the incision, at the time of incision, or after? And as you can see, what this study really found is that the rates of infection will really decrease compared to the other time periods if you gave it less than two hours prior to the incision. As you can see, kind of by the um, biomodal curve here. And then again, it, it doesn't seem feasible that it, or to make much sense to give it after the case because you've already made the incision, you've already injected the bacteria will not come there. And then again, thinking about cutting into tissues, do you deliver that drug to the site of infection after you've damaged the blood flow? Area. It begs the question, it's probably not the best time to go after. This other study done by Steinberg was really nice, and they kind of looked at it and cohorted patients based upon the time that it was given or not given. But it's important to note that they excluded patients who got um, mycomycin or fluoroquinolones given their long infusion times. But what they found was the rates are decreased um, considerably, again, looking at that about two hour window of <coughs> incision, seeing really low numbers around uh, 30 minutes prior to. Now, the problem comes in here is the data in that narrow time window becomes very conflicting. You can find some reports that say it's really good, you can give it within 30 minutes prior to incision. But let's think like a pharmacist. As I tell the students and residents who are all sitting over there when they take my rotation, think kinetic. You give a drug five minutes before you cut, are we really allowing that drug to distribute to the tissue sets? And again, that's when you look at the guideline recommendation that they all to, they felt it's not appropriate to give it right before the incision. You're not allowing the drug to get to an appropriate concentration. Even though if you look back, you can find where the incision, like giving it within 30 minutes prior to incision results in low infection rates. Let's think better. Let's, let's, let's have a little bit more logical sense on that. So just like perioper just like how many timing is everything for, uh, for perioperative dosing? And the guidelines actually say within 60 minutes. They, they, they do note there's not enough robust data to say you should wait till 30 minutes prior and give that dose of antimicrobial. Well, let's think, for all intents and purposes, most of the drugs are going to be on the data right. You know that we can use them very fast. So again, we should, shouldn't be too much of a problem for our perioperative uh, clinicians and nursing <coughs> staff to get us an administration of drugs. However, when we have drugs with longer period time, such as fluoroquinolones and megamycin, it becomes a little bit more problematic. And they kind of take that um, in hand with the mindset we still have to distribute to the site of action and say the adequate window for those drugs is 120 to 60 minutes prior to the case. This is now becoming an issue as our vancomycin doses increase, as I talked about, as I'll talk about in a minute, because as we know, we can't infuse vancomycin very rapidly because of toxicity. So is the dose important? So again, the dose that we select is also potentially a big contributing factor to the development of infection. This nice study that was done many years ago in 1977 noted that infections developed in two out of 175 patients with detectable concentrations at the end of the case versus three of 11 patients in patients with no detectable concentrations. And again, somehow, um, even though that's very small numbers, that's a pretty low p-value. But at the same time, this is one of the studies that's heavily quoted when you talk about making sure, again, the tissues the tissue concentrations are adequate when you're performing the case. Again, I was followed up with another study that showed that higher atrial tissue concentrations resulted in less infections in patients undergoing um, valvular surgery. And 
And again, I think it's intuitive. We have to make sure that enough drug gets to the site of action. Because rule number one, tissue, if the drug isn't present in the tissues, probably isn't going to kill any bacteria that are also present in the tissues. But they're trying to add that. This is another, um, I'm a visual person, so as you can see here, if our patients go in for the case, we give them the antibiotic administration. It probably is a lot cleaner graph than what actually happens. Patients are getting more fluid. But again, we cut. We don't want the highest levels in the tissues at the, at, at the time of incision. But at the same time, we may have a longer case. We may be doing a very complicated surgery, say heart transplant or a cabbage or a pump or some in, intricate uh, lung surgery or something like that. But at the same time, you're going to have to probably redose them because, again, remember the patient can be removing the drug from the body anytime we hook them up to a artificial apparatus to pump blood or to do other things. We may be removing drug um, by that mechanism. Too. So again, we have to take those into consideration, and our patients may get in this vulnerable window. And again, I think one of the other things that the guidelines stress is making sure we redose aggressively. I don't think we were stressing that historically, and I think that they did a wonderful job and I'll kind of show how they did that at the end. But as you can see, you don't want your patient to get into that window right here. It's bad. And if you just to use some examples, let's think about amino glycide. If we have um, uh, if we have an appropriate initial dose, or remember our CP to MIC ratio is going to be inadequate. Right, we're not going to effectively kill our bacteria that are present. If we look at the beta lactam on redosing time, the time of the MIC is going to be uh, suffering because we are not uh, redosing or we didn't give an adequate dose to cover through the, through the operative case um, based upon the patient's weight and or um, This is one of my favorite movies, uh, Monty Python. Uh, it's a, for those of you who know Mr. Creasa, he's a very large man. Um, but I think one of the things that was very much stressed is, again, as the United States uh, has seen in recent years, we have an increased epidemic of obesity. And one of the things we haven't necessarily done a lot is adjust the doses that we recommended historically for our obese patients. And I think the study really highlights that they looked at what were the obese patients according to BMI um, rankings. And what they saw was uh, patients who received one gram of fast and were gastrectomy have lower tissue concentration than normal weight patients who receive the same dose. Surprisingly, or not surprisingly, I should say, their infection rates were very high. I think they were 12 or 20% versus about 2.5%. So that's considerable. Again, now you can see why more obese patients, they're historically linked to developing surgical side effects. Maybe, but the authors went one step further. Maybe we weren't dosing this as So what they did in the second phase of this study was they gave two grams. And what they saw was, again, higher tissue concentration than serum concentration what they had previously. But actually what they also saw was that correlated with lower infection rates. If the infection rates went from about 16 20%, down to about 5% in these patients. So again, thinking medically, they changed what they were doing and improved the outcomes in the patient. They saw less infection in the patient population. So does that make the question, should we just give more? Is more better? Well, I think with certain drugs, as you see, that have, narrow, that have wide therapeutic disease, it's going to be okay to push the dose under some of our patients. So I think it's, it's definitely So again, the dose is important. Newer data would suggest that the old dosing uh, methods we used are inadequate. Again, they recommend using dosing body weights with the glycoside. And now they say, well, you should probably deviate away from this one gram of vancomycin. You really need to give weight-based dosing. This is presenting an issue, especially with places like the Detroit Medical Center, that sees a fair amount patients, again, all said we can have a large component of these patients in our practice. But again, how do we implement them? Do we have to redesign the workflow for OR personnel? Are we going to have to redesign the workflow for pharmacy? How do we order these drugs? These are all things that have come up because of the environment, because we have to get better at doing what we have always done. Moving into the prophylaxis um, duration, it's been a little bit murky. I think we all seen the, um, the pre-printed order sets that say stop after 24 hours. Well, that's really stemming from not data-driven, but just a poor measure. The government says you can't go past 24 hours when you're 15. Well, I think that this is important to highlight that when you actually read the guidelines, there's not a whole lot of real data out there to drive a lot of the duration of antimicrobial therapy, especially after the initial dose. We know the initial dose is it's every other dose after that that happens, and that happens to have a little bit of conjecture around it. In cardiac surgery, where you tend to see longer durations of post-operative um, antimicrobial use, they have looked at that. They studied six versus two days and saw really no difference. But again, they didn't compare that 
to 24 hours. One bill. Again, nobody really knows. And I think that it's important to highlight um, that it's kind of a nebulous, uh, a nebulous issue. But uh, what I will stress to you is we need to take consideration for this because studies are also finding that people who get extended uh, treatment will also have more resistant pathogens identified. Uh, notably, DRE and cephalosporin resistant. So again, when I when you ask me do I think this is important, I can't really answer that because again the studies aren't well describing this this in the literature. So I turn to my cutting edge clinical decision support, which is mentioned, and I don't really know. Right? I don't think anybody knows, but I think that we can allow a little bit of leeway with our surgery staff because again they treat a lot of these patients, they're working very closely with them. How is the power they doing it? Potentially one of you out there may study this one. So again, prophylaxis, the guidelines are really good at saying what to use, what to use, what to use. I'm glad they do that because I can't read all these papers and go back and read it myself. Um, but when you, what they do here, and I'm going to point out, they really do a good job of outlining the type of procedure that you're concerned about. Even going down to the sub type, right? So are you doing a coronary artery bypass? Are you implanting a device like a pacemaker or an ICD? Or are you doing a ventricular assist device? Because the literature and the pathogens that you may be concerned about may have subtle differences between each one of those. So again, it's not just a cardiac procedure, there are different types of cardiac procedures. And again, you can see they have extra for the renal, as well as a laundry list of other ones. But the other thing that they do that I like is they talk to you about the recommended agents. Again, they're trying to list them here. Um, I highlighted them there. You'll see a lot of, lot of drugs that have been around for a long time. Cephasin, cefuroxine, amsulbacrine, of course, vancomycin is always noted uh, when you have an allergy. But these patients, it becomes more difficult because, again, the data is dry and that becomes less robust, let's say. Because you're really turning away from your primary drug and using things that you kind of have to use because the patients don't have uh, the ability to receive the esteem or whatnot. Uh, again, you can kind of see that they do a nice job even going down through the spectrum here for changing the drug. So one of the other things that they did is, what dose do you pick? I need help with that. I'm not a very smart person. So I kind of have to look at this. And what they, if you're a pediatric person, they actually have a pediatric column, which I don't read because they don't come to my hospital. Um, but I'm sure you also to look at them because they do a wonderful job at outlining that. But you can kind of see here that they outline um, these drugs. And again, you can kind of see they get fairly aggressive at things like sepastin, going all the way up to three grams for drugs like drugs like this, but then also recommending, you know, the standard glucoflossin uh, metronidazole, you see genomycin 5 per kilo, which is an updated recommendation from previously, as well as increased doses of the beta lactam, such as suboxetin, cephotitian, cetriaxone, um, versus historical doses. You can kind of see the needs here. They do a nice job of telling you what the common half-life is, going to go into how you would um, redose them, because remember you want to go through half-lives. And then they, they have recommended dosing intervals. So again, you can kind of see here. And as you get shorter half life, as you look here, you get more frequent redosing throughout the case versus the longer half life drugs, where they may not be applicable for you to actually do that if the drug is moving around versus um, shorter half life. So here's my two cents on this. The EMC and the Proto Subcommittee talked about this. Um, I was kind of thrust into the you know, participating in this. Um, I would say kicking and screaming, um, but at the same time, I learned a lot of my training, and hopefully, I can share a lot with you. But again, we work with selecting appropriate and microbiologists, and we're pretty much in line with what the ACPHP guidelines recommend. But again, we haven't really aggressively tried to implement the dosing changes. So for us, we've moved away from one gram capacity and suboxetin doses. We're now pushing two on, on, in our upcoming order sets um, to accommodate that. And even in normal body rate patients, just to stay in the benefit process. I've had some questions about how do we deal with vancomycin. Well, I think that's an important thing for pharmacists. It's like, well, do we make an individualized dose for each patient? It's probably not logistically feasible, especially for a hospital like mine that doesn't have an OR pharmacy. So what we've actually done is we've implemented into information technology, and if a, nerd, if a weight is input in the computer, it automatically selects the dose from the weight range for our clinicians. So that routes it to the pharmacy, we can verify that order, and then, all, and then stock those three doses in the OR areas so we Immediately available for the nurse or whoever is obtaining the And again, we've been stressing the importance of 
understanding that this was identified in our meeting as being the problem. So again, we initially met with the orthopedic group, and we kind of uh, said our order sets don't really work, and we found that we had too many order sets, probably like 70 or 100. Um, that's that's with the, throughout the Detroit Medical Center. So again, we probably have three orthopedic order sets for four hospitals. So we really want to standardize that, so that's where we're moving. And again, we want to fight, identify, identify key stakeholders. So we brought the orthopedics group in. We got their key physician assistants to help us with the generation of uh, these guidelines and, and, and our new order sets. And then we kind of held meetings to discuss how we can improve workload. And this is with perioperative nursing. This is with the admissions people that the patient sees and when they initially walk in the door. Because a lot of this stuff's going to have to change, especially now that we're accommodating the diagnosis of mycomycin. We're having, we may have to have our patients come in earlier in order to receive the full infusion, or at least work with the surgeons to have them turn it back on the cases. So I got my friend Dave, who's my awesome IT guy, because I can not do my computers, I can log into Facebook, and that's good. But he, he really kind of helped us create this big power plan. And this can really be ordered, really. So we can order in the clinic, you can order it three days before, but it's visible across encounters, and our nursing staff can, can initiate this. And, and drop the orders for pharmacy, nursing, vital sign checking, bullying, insertion, and all that stuff. So it's been kind of cool. So we've kind of seen a revitalization of our power plan um, technology, replacing now older, old traditional order sets, and kind of helping streamline the process. Now to kind of talk to you a little bit, as I introduced this thing called the power plan, what I really have to say is it's a space thing. So say you have your physician or your PA three days before. And they look at their chart and they know that they've ordered this case for 8 a.m. on Thursday. And they can go in and they can order the power plan um, on the patient's MRN number. So it doesn't have to be the actual financial encounter number or the counter number at your hospital that you have. But the cool thing about it is it's going to be visible across the county. So when that patient arrives in the perioperative area, they can verify the weight they can verify the weight is correct and do all the things that they need to do. And one of the cool things is going to start routing on those orders once they initiate the process. Because again, those orders weren't necessarily routed to pharmacy when that clinician entered them three years before. But now they are, because our nursing staff members just initiated it. So now pharmacy's got the order for the bank of my The nursing's got the order for the full weight insertion, for the vital sign checking, and for the IV fluid and stuff like you. So it's kind of streamlined. And again, we now have the orders and tasks that are routed out. So we get our labs, we get we now have a Ortho power plan is proposed that's going to map out the orders for the labs days in advance. So if you know you have a hip and you know you want to check CDC each day, that's already in there. We have, we have to set the time doses, set the time labs from the time that the patient waiting to be over. And again, we haven't implemented it yet, but it's going to be very exciting because we're, again, we're kind of revitalizing the whole order set and turning it into something new. Um, though we can't include everything, one of the cool things that the power plan allows for you to do, you can add things. So if you have a surgeon that likes to order this particular lab, it's not evidence-based, that person can continue, can continue to do that while using this skeletonized power plan, and then it would make it very easy to order and discontinue it and modify it at the time based upon the power plan that we have. So again, to summarize, and hopefully I haven't bored you because I know it's right after lunch, but it will play right in with Dr. Pankarazzi's talk presentation. Um, surgical side infection and negative impact on patient outcomes, including increased length of stay and morbidity mortality. Yeah. Patients undergoing surgical, certain surgical procedures should benefit from antimicrobial therapy. We should ensure as pharmacists and technicians that we get those drugs to them as quickly as possible in time to manage. And then again, taking these ASHP guidelines for what they are and then tailoring them to your hospital is very important. So again, it's not cookie cutter. You, um, you're going to have to modify it ever so slightly for your institutional insurance, but at the same time, it will benefit your patients. And then again, utilization of currently available low-cost antimicrobials, again, in the midst of these guidelines and then also treatments, are going to be able to decrease infection rates and lead to decreased healthcare expenditures in your institution. So, uh, my topic today was, I entitled it From Coma to Comfort and Critical Care, uh, updates from the 2013 SCCM guidelines for the management of pain, you know, agitation, and delirium, or PAD. Um, coming from the University of Chicago, where J.P. Kress and Jesse Hall do love uh, sedation research. I was uh, kind of stressing about the amount of information that I have to present today and what was relevant, especially for pharmacists. Um, and while sitting here listening to, listening to Dr. Minus talk, I was trying to figure out how could I make this applicable to medicine today. And it's kind of the 
Same for all, everything else in critical care. Uh, there's a pulmonologist called Scott Abrey. He's in Utah. He writes a, the medical evidence blog or status diagnosis. Um, other than being from Ohio State, he's a pretty good guy and a good researcher. Um, so I was writing some notes if you saw me down here. But he actually had a really relevant post yesterday that was saying we need less is actually more in critical care medicine. And I was jotting down just some ideas about how has practice changed in the past four to five years even ever since I started going into practice. And now we have permissive hypotension in some patients with septic shock depending on how they do clinically. So we're not no longer looking sometimes for a map of 60 to 65, but we allow them to run hypotensive that they want to. There's permissive hypercapnia for COPD patients on ventilators. We have uh, high dose steroids in the ARDS has been disproven and actually causes high mortality. We have low type volume strategies and eubulimic fluid strategies for patients ranging from septic shock to um, patients in acute respiratory stress syndrome. And finally, conservative transfusion strategies in patients who have, even have active GI hemorrhages. So I kind of relate those things um, to sedation as well. And uh, back when I was a kid you know, in the 80s, patients used to get this sedated because it was unethical to have them awake during their ICU stay. You're getting poked, you're getting potted. The ventilator actually hurts. I don't know if anybody's ever been ventilated before. Um, some people relate to being stabbed in the chest. So another relevant article this week, I will only digress once, I swear, but there's the Esmolol article patients with septic shock. So they were controlling heart rate while they were on vasopressors. And again, Dr. Abreg, who was thinking outside the box, says, why are we using more drugs to do these? Maybe it's the body telling us maybe we just need less vasopressor. Let them implicitly hypertensive so that you don't have the adverse effects of applied those vasopressors. That's just some food for thought that I was thinking about. <laughs> the nerd in me. Uh, I have no uh, financial disclosures or relationships of interest in terms of this presentation. And I will be discussing some off-label use of medications that uh, are used in critical care, like most medications that are used in the ICU. I'll start describing the importance of adequate treatment of pain and its consequences in ICU patients. We'll then move, in, move on to very contrasting updates from the previous ones about 10 years ago, uh, which I purposely only put pain and agitation in there because now delirium has uh, come a little bit more to the forefront in the past 11 years or so. And finally, because that is a whole separate section, I'll evaluate new recommendations on the pharmacologic management of ICU delirium or evidence lacking thereof. So, just a little uh, audience participation before I do put you to sleep. Um, say you were being placed in ICU, you, you have respiratory distress, you put on a ventilator. What are your own personal ethical preferences? Who wants to be just knocked the hell out? <laughs> okay, nobody wants to feel anything. Who wants to be made feel, to feel comfortable but arousable? You want to know what's going on, you want to know everything they're doing to you, no matter how horribly. Okay, and who wants to be totally awake to know what was happening? Not you. Okay, remember that. So pain is defined in the medical literature as physical, emotional, or mental lack of well-being. It ranges from anything from mild discomfort to acute unbearable agony. So it's a very wide range, and it's a very subjective thing. Different people, some people are, for lack of a better term, babies, and some are very strong, very brave. It can be generalized or localized. So you can have pre-existing diseases that definitely can produce pain. Invasive procedures, we do a lot of those. And then finally, trauma. This pain produces a reaction of wanting to avoid, escape, or even destroy the causative factor. And who would it be when you have a bunch of holes sticking in you with tubes? Who would it want? Who would not be agitated? It's a natural thing for these patients. So I see patients, they constantly experience pain. You go in the ICU, we're saving their life, but we're actually, it's a form of torture. Um, you have monitoring therapeutic devices, you have IV catheters, their drains, I already said the mechanic ventilator actually causes pain. And finally, Foley catheters have been independently associated with agitation and delirium, just having them in. Routine nursing care, there's frequent airway suctioning, uh, physical therapists, while they have you, the best intentions, you know, make these people move when they don't want to. Uh, there are dressing changes, especially those of you who work in burn units. And then finally, mobilization, which is a big part of what I'll get into later. 
Uh, definitely, in patients who have been sitting for days in a bed on a ventilator or on a dialysis machine, uh, definitely would have pain from immobile, being immobile. So pain actually causes a physiologic response, which has good and bad things. So your body, in response to pain, actually increases its heart rate, which therefore increases cardiac output. It best to maintain your blood pressure and organ perfusion. But the risk of that is our patients who are hypertensive then leads to myocardial ischemia, and then can lead to uh, life threatening arrhythmias, which are commonly seen in uh, patients who are very, very agitated. Uh, you have sodium and water retention. This increases your intravascular volume, again, maintaining MAP and organ perfusion. But the downside of that is hyponatremia, hyperbolemia, pulmonary edema, and just heart failure. Your blood glucose goes up. You increase your metabolism. That ensures substrate availability from the body, but again, you have hypoglycemia, osmotic diuresis, hyperosmolarity, and nitrogen wasting, which all leads to muscle wasting. And then finally, the increased platelet aggregation and immunosuppression. The increased platelet aggregation contributes to hemostasis, but on the flip side, too much of a good thing, you have thrombosis. And then finally, with immunosuppression, you're at risk for infection. And then you have to see that. So, on the flip side of that, while you have physical, physiologic effects, you also have neurologic uh, effects to inadequate pain in uh, ICU patients. This alters your sleep pattern. That leads to exhaustion. You may be being woken up every four hours for a glucose check or if you're on insulin drip, it's every hour and you're being poked. This leads you to be, this leads you to being disoriented. Finally, you get really mad, you're agitated. Then, the worst part of the spectrum would be So the first thing that I did, anybody who knows me and has taken my rotation, is that I went straight to PubMed as soon as I got the topic, and I put in a search for ICU sedation and delirium since 1980. And up until, let's say about the 2000s, you actually see that there hasn't really been much. Uh, the yellow line indicates the uh, sedation plus delirium trials, and sedation only trials are indicated in the blue because I wanted to show the difference between how much delirium has actually not been studied since 1980. In 1995, a group of physicians put out the first parameters for pain and agitation in ICU patients. And I say parameters very loosely because, again, as you can see, there were only 120 sedation uh, studies prior from 1980 all the way to 1995, and then uh, only 17 delirium case reports and treatment. So in 1995, this is the first document that determined the uh, uh, long-term analgesia of sedation in ICU patients. It was non-systemic analgesia modalities were excluded, so nothing non-pharmacologic. And then it provided only six total recommendations. I mean, this thing is front and back, maybe two or three pages. And it provides six recommendations, only on the expert opinion, and little clinical evidence was actually available. So um, I posted the levels uh, or how they graded their evidence uh, here because each one of the DAC guidelines actually takes a twist on that. But their level one was convincingly justifiable on the scientific evidence alone. Whereas already at level two, they say it's reasonably justifiable, but then it's strongly supported by our experts. And then the last one, level three, was adequate scientific evidence is lacking, but widely supported by available data and expert opinion. So it's basically completely expert opinion on level three of this in this 1995 parameter paper. So half of the recommendations were actually about analgesia in this patient population. Level two morphine was a preferred opioid, very specific and evidence-based you can see. Uh, with fentanyl as a second line for hemodynamically unstable patients, again level two, and finally hydromorphone may, may be an ultimate. And that's all you have. For sedation, they gave a whopping two. You can use midazolam or propofol for less than 24 hours if it's needed for anxiety. And then lorazepam for prolonged treatment of anxiety. So basically, they're recommending lorazepam continuous infusion drips for anybody who requires long term sedatives. There was exactly one recommendation for delirium, and it was actually level. They considered it level one. That held up for the treatment of delirium for everybody. So this was based actually only on a few case reports. They admitted it was only clinical expert opinion. 
based on the knowledge of pharmacodynamic properties of the drug Alperidol. And there were no studies at this point actually proving its efficacy uh, in reducing the duration of delirium in ICU patients. Then in 1996, Dr. James Campbell, God bless him, gave a presidential address at the American Pain Society, and he coined the term uh, pain is the fifth vital sign. So he said vital signs are taken seriously. If pain were assessed with the same zeal as other vital signs, it would have a much better chance of being treated properly. We need to train doctors and nurses to treat pain as a vital sign. Quality care means that pain is measured and treated. So we all kind of know how the history of that went and how uh, our deaths from prescription opioids uh, increased staggeringly. But they also got the Joint Commission to recognize the appropriate the, the need for appropriate pain management and uh, actually part, put this part of their survey so it was needed for everybody. So it caused the development of standards for pain assessment and management um, in hospitalized patients, especially for those in critical care. You want to maintain optimum level of comfort and safety in ICU patients. And then finally, it called for actual evidence-based guidance on how to appropriately manage pain agitation and delirium in this population. So again, back to our NICI graph. Uh, in 2002, the first guidelines were actually published by the Provider Society of Critical Care Medicine, actually with the help of the ACC. So from, from there, we've gotten a little, a little bit better. There are, between those time frames, about 187 sedation trials, and they doubled the number of delirium trials to 33 in only seven years. Still, not much uh, extra work being done on delirium at that point. Then finally, for the 2013 guidelines, you see since 2002, this is uh, basically skyrocketed. It looks like our national debt. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Uh, 727 uh, set of trials with two, uh, amazing 240 only in 10 years since. And so you can see delirium now is actually taking up a larger proportion of that total. Um, just quickly going through the 2002 guidelines and how they graded evidence. A was uh, strong methods, consistent results, prospective randomized controlled trial uh, with no heterogeneity. B was still those methods were strong, results and consistent. Still, those prospective randomized controlled trials about heterogeneity was present. Finally, C was where the methods were weak and or they were observational studies. And those were only the three grades of evidence that they gave. In contrast to 2013, grade A had, it had to be a high quality prospective randomized controlled trial. B was a prospective randomized controlled trial with significant limitations or a high quality observational study. So, observational studies got a little bit of a boost. Finally, C was just the plain observational. Then they added a number to that grade to provide the strength of the recommendation. So zero was no uh, recommendation either way. One was very strong, two weak. And then they also, in addition, gave it a plus minus before or against that particular recommendation. All right, so now we're gonna dive into the differences between the 2002 SEC main and education guidelines with what we do have currently. So pain, everybody has it, you just spent a bunch of time talking about it, so um, again, the stupid humor. But um, in 2002, pain assessment, they really only made one comment. They said pain assessment and response to therapy should be performed regularly by using a scale appropriate to the patient population and systematically documented. That doesn't give a lot of help, really. There, were, there was very little in terms of the objective pain assessment back in before 2002, 1995 to 2002. But now, with the grade of plus one B, they say pain should be monitored in ICU patients routinely. So since then, there's been uh, production and uh, validation of objective pain assessment tools. This one, just um, really quickly, is the BPS or the behavioral pain scale. On the left is your pain behavior, and then from left to right is there's none, mild, moderate, or severe. Again, still technically very subjective, but we're heading in the way of trying to objectify the amount of pain and correlate that with the amount of energy that we need to provide. Everybody's favorite, um, pain assessment through vital signs. Even when I was in school, they taught it. Um, with a great view recommendation in 2002, they said, patients who cannot communicate should be assessed through subjective observation of pain-related behavior and psychological, I'm sorry, physiological indicators and the change in these parameters following therapy. But in 2013 now, they actually do not suggest that vital signs be used in pain 
assessment. And vital signs alone may be used as a cue to begin further assessment of pain. So there have been multiple studies, and I listed them at the bottom. But basically, the gist of it is that protocolized pain assessment significantly reduces the use of analgesics, ICU length of stay, and duration of mechanical ventilation. So that's very important. But there's actually inconsistent evidence of the ability of those vital signs for the purpose of pain assessment. And they're unreliable predictors of pain, especially in patients who um, you know, may be on continuous uh, dialysis on mechanical ventilator and septic shock and beta depressors and antibiotics and you know, 20 different drugs and getting years and years of fluid on the side to maintain their blood pressures. So in terms of treatment of pain, 2002, they recommended a therapeutic plan goal should be established. Very vague, once again, because that data just wasn't there. Fentanyl was the preferred for a rapid onset of analgesia. So from 1995, they went from morphine to uh, using fentanyl as the primary agent. And then finally, morphine or hydromorphone were preferred for intermittent therapy with grade C. Again, the data just wasn't there. They were just doing this based on clinical experience. In 2013, they pretty much say any IV opioid as a first line drug class to treat non neuropathic pain is acceptable as long as you're using equivalent doses. Secondly, non opioid analgesics may be considered to reduce opioid use. Um, there's a movement towards using the non opioids to prevent the adverse effects of them. Finally, uh, PO gabapentin or carbamazepine as addition to the treatment of neuropathic pain in these patients. Quick pharmacology refresh, refresh on opiates. Again, the dose is. <coughs> As long as they're echopotent, they seem to have the same clinical effect, depending on which one you're using. The onsets are fairly similar and fairly quick, except with fentanyl, and rapid fentanyl being the quickest, and methadone by far being the longest. Um, with uh, half-lives, very similar. Again, uh, rapid fentanyl uh, having the shortest half-life and uh, being associated with rebound pain in patients who don't get consistently dosed. Whereas uh, for metabolism, fentanyl has the uh, ND alkylation and uses the P450 system as a substrate. Hydromorphone and morphine both use blue bronidation. And of the top three, only morphine has an active metabolite. So um, fentanyl and hydromorphone tend to not improve in as much in renal failure or liver failure. Finally, methadone has an active metabolite. Its half life is very long, its on site is very long. Uh, there are some Retrospective data to show that maybe switching patients to methadone may uh, reduce patients' length of stay in the ICUs because you can transition them from one of the shorter acting opiates to the longer ones. So methadone is starting to find a little niche in ICU patients. In terms of the non opiates, we have pentacarbamazepine, again, long half lives. Um, these are the beginning doses, and they are titrated to effect for patients with neuropathic pain. We have is renal excretion, and um, Closer that I saw last year, it's SECM. They showed that patients with congestive heart failure actually had increased, um, heart, uh, significantly higher uh, incidence of heart failure exacerbations because of fluid retention. Uh, so I don't know, necessarily know going forward where the would be at um, for these uses, but as of now, there, are, there is data to show that they can be effective in patients with neuropathic pain. The guidelines do mention insects, but I'm going to gloss over them right now. Uh, they're generally avoided. Patients, especially um, in my practice, our number one admission is GI bleeding and uh, patients with liver failure, coagula, coagulation abnormalities, history of alcoholism. Uh, renal failure is common in these patients. Many of them have been common in the case therapy. Uh, a lot of congestive heart failure and cirrhosis and asthma. So we tend to avoid them as much as possible. So, agitation. So, untreated pain leads to agitation. <laughs> And um, it occurs very frequently despite adequate pain control in patients in the ICU. Even though you're controlling their pain, you're still altering their sleep patterns. Um, I know our ICU uh, rooms have very little natural light, so they don't really know what the day night sleep cycle is uh, once they're three days in. So anxiety, anxiety and agitation actually is associated with adverse clinical outcomes in ICU patients, where sedatives are commonly administered to treat agitation because kind of historically we just don't want to deal with it. Uh, sleeping patient is a happy patient, is what I always heard uh, from the nurses. Especially um, there's data for nocturnal increasing of sedation significantly to make the patient sleep and cooperate. 
And then finally, complex identification and treatment of the underlying cause is extremely important. I'll go into that right now. So on the left here, you can see the percentage of patients with severe education in this particular study. Um, on the bottom right, the causes that they uh, pin for these patients with severe education. You can see that things that happen extremely commonly in our patient population, so pain, medications themselves, delirium and anxiety are all very frequent precipitators of severe agitation in this patient population as a whole. But it's not just one thing, it's multifactorial. In the same study, they looked at the same patient population, but then on the bottom you have a number of contributing factors per episode. So the majority of patients actually had <coughs> three contributing factors that led to their cases of severe agitation. So for sedation assessment in 2002, they said a sedation goal or one should be established and regularly defined for each patient. Again, very vague, great see evidence not there in the literature. And then the use of a validated sedation assessment scale for recommend. And at that time, there actually really wasn't. So in 2013, we know a lot more now. Uh, maintaining light levels of sedation is associated with improved clinical outcomes is a great immediate recommendation. And then again, maintaining light levels of sedation increases the physiologic stress, but is not associated with increased incidence of an MI. So back again to our physiologic response to pain, there is a certain amount of pain the body can handle. While it alters the, the amount of physiologic stress, it actually doesn't lead to bad physical outcomes like MI. Finally, sedatives should be titrated to maintain light rather than deep station. And it actually gets a plus one B recommendation. So about monitoring sedation depth objectively, uh, again, I'll also over the risk management station sedation scale or RAS, uh, which we commonly use in RIC and DMC. It's a scale that goes from negative five, which is around the lower, on around the lower column. Uh, some of you are alert from home right now, and some may be in the light station lines too. And then plus four would be hyperactive, combative, uh, <coughs> agitation, slash delirium. Now there's a lot of literature out there, and I just wanted to give a little bit uh, to you of the most uh, pronounced trials that led to these recommendations. Uh, these are mostly uh, depth of sedation trials, the four most common. So Pull up and colleagues in 1998 did a prospective observational study of continuous IV versus intermittent or no sedation in mechanically ventilated patients. By the way, most uh, ICs in Europe try to use the no sedation, um, especially in Denmark, they give every one to one sitters for everybody to reorient them every time that they feel agitated. Um, the primary outcome was duration of mechanical ventilation. You can see based on the hours that no or intermittent sedation actually decreased the number of hours on the mechanical ventilator, with secondary outcomes also being significant of ICU and hospital length of stay. J.P. Kress at the University of Chicago uh, and his colleagues at the time did a single center for prospective randomized trial level. Um, this is where you get the sedation wake ups the daily. Uh, this protocol is driven daily interruption of continuous IV sedation in mechanically ventilated patients. Their duration of mechanical ventilation was much shorter in the patients receiving the interruption. And ICU length of stay was approximately three days short because it should be noted that most of these patients receive midazolam and propofol at fairly, fairly high doses, and then morphine at the time of their uh, continuous uh, opiate. Then the ABC trial was done in 2008, which was a multi-center prospective randomized trial. It was a protocol driven paired sedation and spontaneous breathing trials, so they paired those together, which is uh, what we commonly use in the ABC today. And their primary outcome was days without mechanical ventilation, and again, that was significantly higher in patients who were on the paired protocol. They also had a significantly decreased ICU and hospital length of stay compared to those who were not on the protocol. Finally, the last one in 2009 was a single center prospective randomized trial of light versus deep sedation in mechanically ventilated patients. They uh, were, instead of days on the ventilator or ICU length of stay, they were looking at post traumatic stress. Uh, the post traumatic stress patients. Were actually more, uh, there was no difference between the two, but more disturbing memories were involved in patients with light sedation versus deep. So, 
while they're experiencing more just disturbing memories, they're actually an instance of most of the traumatic stress were no different. So now we know, know that we want light versus deep station in most patients. Um, so what about what sedative are we going to use if we need it, if the patients are severely agitated? So in 2002, their number one choice was that the day's line or day exam should be used with rapid sedation of acutely agitated patients. Then propofol is preferred to prevent rapid awakening as importance, such as your neuro uh, patients that need to keep an hour checks. Thirdly, they said the day's line for short term use as it produces uh, unpredictable awakening and time to excavation when given for greater than two to three days. And again, um, for patients who need continuous um, sedation due to the pharmacodynamic properties, of the risk path that they uh, still consider it in the first line for continuous sedation in the ICU. It's, if you look over to the 2013 column, it's much more succinct. What they say is a sedation strategy using non diet benzodiazepine sedatives, propofol, or everyone's favorite dexmedetomidine, may be preferred to improve clinical outcomes in capillary ventilated ICU patients with a greater cost to be. So, like we did for the OPA2 to refresh around sedatives. Um, really quickly, I'll just say that uh, the days and lorazepam, similar onsets um, of action, and their half lives are similar as well. The days and dose of sedation, or lorazepam's blue foundation, and the big um, point between the two is that, yes, the days and does have active metabolites that accrues in renal failure. For propofol, onset similar, dose of sedation, no active metabolites. Dexmedetomidine, um, the important thing to look at here is in the ICU sedation, these higher infusion rates than are in the package insert, all the way up to 1.5 micrograms per kilogram per hour. The onset is much longer, 5 to 10 minutes, and usually takes about a half hour after a dose increase on the infusion um, to actually have that appropriate effect. So um, when I see dexmedetomidine, benzos were actually used as IV push that bridges to increase the um, and finally, I include fennel down here because while it's an opiate and an analgesic, it does have sedative properties. Um, it's fairly quick onset, similar half life to uh, the benzos, and does not have active metabolites. Um, and again, anybody who's having a rotation or a residence here, I say that my sedative never black and white, there's always a lot of gray. So um, I like to recommend sedative choice based on the patient situation. So again, SAS epilepticus, obviously first line of ICU benzo, or even propofol. Alcohol withdrawal with near tremens, first line again, benzos. Prevention of mentally associated trauma uh, in patients with ARDS, so both headline strategies, uh, inverted to IQ ratios, or again, again, severe agitation. They all can be different scenarios based on specific patient population. Does that patient, what type of comorbidities do they have? What type of uh, renal or liver failure do they have, et cetera? Finally, we want to show a choose your depth and duration. So again, light versus deep, again, depending on the situation. Um, and then short versus extended, again. Patient-specific factors, I mentioned organ dysfunction, and then the potential for adverse effects. These are the trials that looked at, uh, which gave them the recommendation of the non-benzodiazepine uh, recommendation of continuous sedatives. So Carson and colleagues in 2006 did prospective multi-center randomized open label study, which used intermittent bolus or ISPAM versus continuous propofol in uh, cancer ventilated patients. And you see that they had a range goal of two to three so light sedation. Their mean ventilator days was actually significantly shorter in the patients that were on the, the continuous propofol versus the intermittent bolus or ISPAM. But there's no difference in 28-day ventilator-free survival, ICU, or hospital length of stay, or even hospital mortality. So it really just got to the ventilator sooner, is what their conclusion was. Fong and colleagues uh, used the IMPACT database in 2007 as a retrospective single center trial. And they again looked at intermittent bull, intermittent bulls of lorazepam versus propofol in mechanically ventilated patients as sole sedatives. Um, prolonged mechanical ventilation was more common in patients who received the benzos in both the medical and surgical ICU population. And their medium uh, and the ventilator days were significantly increased when the benzos were used as well. 
one of the more important trials um, in terms of ICD LAM was the men's trial in 2007. It was a prospective multi center randomized control trial. It was the uh, continuous raising hand versus dexmedetomy in preventative <coughs> patients. It showed that delirium free days was significantly lower in patients who received dexmedetomy and as well as coma free days. There was no, uh, but they did not find a difference in uh, mechanical labor. Which you would think could uh, would be a benefit in next time because it didn't suppress the respiratory drive. And then 20 day mortality was no different, even though they may have had more delirium or coma. Uh, Jesse Hall and colleagues in 2001 had a prospective randomized multi center trial. These are the Dazlan trials. So they did the continuous the Dazlan versus propofol. There was uh, time of excavation was quicker in patients who received propofol. Uh, both at less than one day, one to three days, and greater than three days. Their ICU length of stays, however, were no different, and their time spent at sedation goal, well, sedation goal is uh, significantly better though than with using propofol. Then finally, the SECCOM uh, group in 2009 did a prospective double blind multi center uh, randomized control trial of prolonged sedation with continuous midazolam versus dexmedetomy in patients with a light sedation goal. Rats times two, uh, two plus one. So as you can see here, their time within the RAS goal range is actually no difference between uh, benzo and dexmedetomy, and their but their incidence of delirium was much much higher with the And you can kind of see a pattern here with benzos and delirium, but um, also their time excavation was shorter with patients on dexmedetomy. Um, it's worth noting that all of these studies that I talked about allowed uh, adjunct opioid use. For uh, the newest one that I had to add uh, was done in 2012. It was a uh, pretty cool trial design. We did two prospective double blind multi center randomized control trials all at once. Uh, they were named Prodex and Mydex. So it was prolonged sedation with continuous dex, metamine, versus propofol or continuous midazolam. The time uh, at target sedation was actually no different between the two trials. So we both maintained light sedation appropriately. But, uh, the only real difference they saw was that uh, while there's no difference in time on mechanical ventilation with propofol versus dexmedetomy, midazolam actually was significantly longer. So there's kind of a knock on the benzodiazepine based sedation regimens, which were recommended in the 1995 2002 guidelines. So the suggestion is that mechanical ventilation is prolonged with these benzodiazepine based regimens uh, based on all the previous studies that I mentioned. And despite objective sedation assessment and light sedation goals with, uh, with the RAS tool, this leads to potentially longer IC length of stay. Uh, a meta analysis of all these trials showed that you probably get a benefit of about half a day uh, for benzodiazepines versus non benzodiazepines and uh, with PLA of 0.04. There's no apparent increase in mortality between benzodiazepines and non benzodiazepine sedatives, uh, like it was inferred before these trials were done. But there's actually a, a lack of evidence to suggest that these uh, benzodiazepine-based regimens actually increase ICU costs. Um, there's no difference in, in the few economic trials that were done. So do benzos produce ICU delirium? Uh, delirium is an independent uh, risk factor for six months and 12 month mortality in ICU patients. So obviously benzodiazepines cause them. Do they actually cause for mortality. So uh, the relationship between benzodiazepines and propofol causing delirium, since propofol has a similar mechanism of action, is really unclear. There's only one high quality study that favors dexmedetomy uh, for preventing delirium uh, compared to benzodiazepines. And then there's no relationship between benzodiazepines and delirium in the men's trial. Um, but in a subgroup analysis, only the septic patients actually were favored uh, dexmedetomy. Wes Ely down at Vanderbilt in 2006 put up this uh, trial of risk factors for uh, ICU delirium. Anybody who knows ICU delirium knows he's the king of it. Um, it was a prospective observational cohort of almost 200 mechanically ventilated patients. The raising panel was an independent predictor of delirium in these patients, whereas fentanyl, morphine, and propofol were all not significantly increased delirium, but um, they weren't uh, implicated. The only other risk factors were age and Apache score uh, that actually increased your risk of delirium. What was really kind of cool about this trial was that they gave this graph, where on the left you have a 
valerian. And it looks like after only two milligrams per day of raisinpam, you significantly increase your chance of transitioning to delirium in the ICU. Something that um, we commonly use now at the DMC ever since um, I started there about 18 months ago uh, this is this paradigm shift of analogous sedation. So I mentioned uh, fentanyl in the sedative table, but the idea is to manage pain and discomfort prior to the initiation of sedatives. And if you do need one, uh, that sedative hypnotics do not have analgesic properties. So why don't we kill two birds with one stone and use fentanyl as monotherapy in patients uh, requiring sedation due to anxiety and agitation and due to its sedative you know, analgesic properties. So we use anywhere from 0.5 micrograms per kilo per hour all the way, our range goes all the way up to 10 micrograms per kilo per hour. And we use it as monotherapy unless there's another indication. This actually been studied, usually it's remy fentanyl, but when remy fentanyl and fentanyl were compared head to head, there was a detection of difference in, uh, in their effects. But uh, when compared to the sedative hypnotics, they had shorter duration of the ventilation, there's more rapid weaning from the ventilator, reduced, it reduces your ICU length of stay, and there's no differences in human dynamic instability. It may hurt you in the pocketbook on your, in your pharmacy budget, but overall, you see the cost savings um, in, in terms of ICU cost. Not currently implicated in causing higher rates of ICU delirium either, so that could be a potential uh, advantage of using opiates to, or in particular fentanyl as your primary sedative. So let's move on to Lyrum, hopefully sometime later tonight. It's Friday, I think they have one of these. <laughs> so I see the is a syndrome of acute onset cerebral dysfunction. It's a change or fluctuation in mental status with inattention, disorganized thinking, and altered level of consciousness. consciousness. Now everyone, when they think of Lyrum, thinks of somebody jumping out of their bed, pulling all the lines up, pulling tubes out, and that's particularly what the nurse and physicians associate with Lyrum. However, but there are some types. Are there subtypes. You have hyperactive, which is agitation, hallucinations, delusions, what you commonly um, associate with delirium. But there's also hypoactive delirium, which is calm, lethargic, they're confused, they seem sedated, and they're often, this is often misdiagnosed because they're a happy, sedated patient laying in bed, but they have really uh, altered mental status. And patients can fluctuate between being hypoactive and hyperactive. Spend about half the time in each or most of the time in one. It's more common than you think, actually. It affects up to 80% of patients uh, that are in the ventilators in ICUs. And it costs you about four to $16 billion annually in the United, the United States. Uh, the pathophysiology is poorly understood. There's ongoing trials right now. But it is definitely underdiagnosed. Uh, hypoactive delirium is actually uh, more common than the hyperactive form. There, until more recently, have been a lack of research until the past decade. Uh, there's actually a website now for ICU delirium, the ICU delirium that board. It's done by the West Sealy guy down at Vanderbilt. He's associated now with the government and the uh, VA down there. They do a lot of delirium research. It's known as an independent predictor of negative clinical outcomes. So increased mortality at six months and one year after ICU uh, discharge. Increases your hospital length of stay. I just mentioned that increased cost of care. And then finally, long-term dementia-like state is, uh, is an effect that happens commonly in a lot of the elderly patients that experience ICU delirium. So to, for everything else, we do pain, education, now delirium assessment to learn to assess what they're doing. There was a uh, routine assessment for delirium is recommended. Again, in the literature, they back to really didn't have a good tool to do that. Now, uh, with a grade of plus one B, is that routine assessment for is actually recommended, and that the CAMICU and ICDSC scales are the most valid and reliable monitoring tools that you can use in the ICU. So really quickly, just to clear my identification, this is the CAMICU scale. Step one is sedation assessment. Uh, so they have to be within a particular rascal to even perform the test. And then going down to step two is delirium assessment. You ask them uh, a lot of weird questions. You go up to them, I'm gonna ask you a lot of weird questions right now. Uh, balloon flow in the air, does it rock sink in water? Um, and whether or not they can appropriately answer you is how they check with some of the ICU delirium. And finally, you perform, they call it save a heart, or you have to squeeze your hand every time you say 
called Save a Heart with two A's in heart. And every time you say, hey, they're supposed to squeeze your hand, and if they miss one or two of them, then you know, it's an automatic positive. So it's fairly quick, fairly easy to do. Anybody can do it. Um, so just prophylaxis for delirium. 2002, guys, I don't even mention it. They had nothing to go on. But in 2013, we actually have a lot more to go on these days. So they recommend early mobility when feasible. And that's probably the most important thing that I can stress today, even as pharmacists. You know,
Short term use, we tend to use uh, intermittent pushes of those benzos that I have to dispose of. We do not have excellent time in formulary, so we don't use it uh, very often, if, if at all. Uh, Searches on children too. Uh, they did somehow. But um, for the raised pan, again, uh, intermittent doses are the preferred ones, but if they do need a continuous drip, again, um, we do utilize propofol or midazolam. And then we do have uh, spontaneous awakening trials every day, and those are the solutions. Finally, for uh, delirium, we use a non pharmacologic uh, stepwise process. So we uh, promote sleep, minimize noise, try to close the doors, close their windows, and then at the time, open everything up. Early and aggressive mobility, and then we promote circadian uh, rhythm cycles. Finally, if things get uh, really bad, then we will resort to uh, how health care all is needed. Um, and then uh, rotidine can be used uh, 25 to 50 milligrams every two hours and then titrate to effect. But uh, first, we want to make sure that we're maximizing our pain strategies, minimizing our defensos, and assessing prevention uh, needs for our use. So that will conclude. So the question is, so the question was the use of so the question was the use of genomycin in the OB patient population. I um, I can't speak to what the EMC is going to do from that because our current dosing guidelines reflect the old recommendations. I think the conundrum to get into there is there's that whole shift when they have the baby um, preterm, what do you do, and then transitioning to post uh, postpartum. I think that that's something we will be approaching. I know that we're looking at adjusting some dosing on uh, our current OB guidelines. I think that will be addressed, though we tend to bring in the OB groups in to that comment. Though I wouldn't, I, I think that's probably a caveat. I'm not familiar with the data with dosing high dose once daily and preterm. Or pre partum, uh, so I, I can't say that we can go to the high dose in the patient population as of yet. But I stay informed and email you later. See you. you mentioned that the target is 60 minutes prior to the decision to get the pre antibiotics. If the patient comes down from the floor and they're already on the floor, can they just omit that pre antibiotics? That's a good question. So the question is if the patient's already on the floor and they have a preoperative pre dose, um, I'm fairly confident that's addressed, and I think that they said it should be sufficient, though I would comment on that if the dosing interval is due to um, need another dose. I think that these cases are one-on-one -on -one cases, and I think, I think you should probably re-dose it because a lot of these uh, intraoperative fluid shifts, these patients may get a lot of fluid, and need to make sure that so I would tend to have that as an educational thing, just for the surgeons and your perioperative staff to know potentially to bring up the fact that this patient may be dosing prior to the decision. What's your opinion on zero dose antibiotics for pregnant women? Um, so the uh, question is, what is my opinion on antibiotic irrigations? I will leave my opinion on that because I don't think there's a lot of data to support that. A lot of times they get omitted from um, order sets and whatnot. I do know that they are commonly used. Uh, we have requests for mycin irrigation to be used, but I think that the data is not as well described. We can talk one on one after um, about that, but I don't think they're, I, they weren't necessarily mentioned as heavily in the guidelines if I'm not mistaken. Um, that's a good question. That's the correct answer to number seven. <laughs> <laughs>